This video will highlight several areas of the world where two competing ideologies, liberal democracy championed by the United States and its Western allies, and socialism supported by the Soviet Union and its satellite states, came into conflict. The focus of these next units will illustrate several of the means that the U.S. conducts its foreign policy with. We'll focus on diplomatic remediation, military employment, and treaty negotiation in this video. Remember, these are just three elements that the U.S. can use to conduct foreign policy. So let's start with diplomatic remediation. Let's look at a topic that we already studied um, during the Cold War. Remember the Cuban Missile Crisis? This happened when the Soviet Union, led by leader Nikita Khrushchev, placed nuclear weapons, as illustrated by these bombs, on a communist-friendly island, Cuba, located just off the southern coast of Florida just a hundred miles away. Well, why did the USSR do this? Um, well, remember, the US and the Soviet Union were competing for world influence during that time. One way to illustrate your power, especially in the 1960s, was to possess nuclear weapons and then place them around the world. The US had nuclear weapons in Europe pointed toward the USSR, and the Soviet Union decided it wanted to level the playing field and place nuclear facilities in Cuba and point them towards the US. So how did the U.S. respond to this challenge? Well, there was a couple different options, but let's look back at the history of Cuba first. You may remember that Cuba became communist in 1957 during a revolution led by Fidel Castro and also Che Guevara, who you know from all those t-shirts. The Soviet Union had itself become communist in 1917 after it overthrew the czars, so it really respected Cuba's stance as a communist state especially view Cuba as an important ally given the proximity of Cuba to Florida. So imagine that you're JFK, the president during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it's October 1962. How do you respond to this new threat? Do you either attack the missile facilities and hope for the best and avoid nuclear war? Or do you do nothing and wait? They were proponents of both of these stances during this time. But ultimately, as mentioned earlier, there was a non-military quote-unquote, blockade of Cuba, as illustrated by all these boats. That was meant to disallow nuclear weapons from coming into the island. After the blockade was set up, diplo excuse me, diplomatic channels were opened up with the Soviets, and they, JFK and his top officials talked to Nikita Khrushchev and his top officials. And ultimately, what was agreed on was that the Soviet Union would relinquish its missile facilities on Cuba in exchange for the United States pledging not to interfere with Cuba's sovereignty. You may recall the Bay of Pigs fiasco in this instance. So that was diplomatic remediation. Let's look at military intervention now during the Vietnam War. Vietnam, as we know it, used to exist as two countries, North and South Vietnam. When the French exited in 1954, um, North Vietnam and South Vietnam split. Northern Vietnam uh, started just north of Da Nang and went north into Hanoi, was the socialist part of the country, and South Vietnam was the democratic part of the country. You'll notice the two flags. The top is the current flag of Vietnam today, whereas the flag on the bottom illustrated what was South Vietnam. Now, what U.S. officials feared during this stage of the Cold War was Northern Vietnam um, if the whole country became communist, uh, then, you know, the neighbors, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, they also all might become communist at that time. This was something called the domino effect. If one country becomes communist, all the other countries become communist. So the United States did not want that to happen. So it employed military force against northern Vietnam in that time. Military escalations really started in 65 68 was the Tet Offensive that we talked about, and then in 75, effectively, the war ended, as you know. Uh, over about 40,000 servicemen and women were killed from the United States. In Vietnam, an estimated quarter of a million servicemen, women, and children. Civilians were all killed during that conflict, and as we know, northern Vietnam was linked with southern Vietnam, and it became one Vietnam, a socialist state. So... We looked at diplomatic remediation, military intervention. Now let's discuss the final element, treaty negotiations. So 
During the Cold War, in 1972, the United States and the Soviet Union recognized that both states had a lot of nuclear weapons, and this really began to be quite frightening. You may have heard the old story, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union at one point possessed enough nuclear power to blow up the world like three or four times or something. So uh, it was a scary kind of state of mind, and, and each state realized it might be beneficial to reduce our nuclear stockpile should the worst happen. So the goal was to limit the number of nuclear weapons that each state could possess. There was a quota for the United States, and there was a quota for the Soviet Union. They met in 1972 and signed a treaty limitation that said you can only have this many nuclear warheads. SALT II was also modified, signed seven years later. It limited that number again in accordance with what had progressed during the time. So this was an example of treaty negotiation. Briefly, these are just three of the ways the United States can conduct its foreign policy drawn from our studies during the Cold War. We'll continue to look at more methods of U.S. foreign policy as we continue this unit. Good work.